Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, as everybody is kind of finishing checking in and finding a seat, just to, uh, yeah, I want to just express, like, we are so blessed. And I want us to, as we sing today, as we worship this morning, um, encourage you to turn your hearts towards Christ and just be able to sing with joy, um, sing with thankfulness, and sing with God. God has been so good to us. Um, yeah, for those of you who are seated, uh, if you'd like, let's stand together and sing.
Psalm 36, verses 5 to 9, reads, Your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. Your righteousness, your justice like the ocean depths. You care for people and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your unfailing love, O God. All humanity finds shelter in the shadow of your wings. You feed them from the abundance of your own house letting them drink from the river of your delights. For you are the fountain of life, the light by which we see. As we continue to sing together, let's uh, continue to just turn our hearts towards Christ. Mm, yeah, towards the, the goodness of his nature and all that he's done for us. Uh, let's continue to sing together. darkness we were waiting without hope and without light heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throneless glory to a cradle in the dirt Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. O God of glory, majesty, O praise to the King of kings. To reveal the kingdom come And to reconcile the lost To redeem the whole creation You did not despise the cross For even in your suffering You saw to the other side Knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died That is our prayer this morning. God, would you turn our hearts completely towards you? Lord, we invite you to change us. We invite you to work. And, um, yeah, God, we, we want to be more like you. We want to reflect you more and more to the world around us. Thank you so much for your generous to us, God. Pray all these things in your name, Jesus. Right. All right, kids, if you've signed up for Sunday school, this is your time to go see Miss Emily. She's way over there waving. And if uh, you're here and you are a little one and you are staying with us for the message, um, you should have gotten a little bag that you can uh, 
You can unpack and take notes, color, do whatever you want um, with that. And uh, we're just glad that you're here, families. And uh, also, if you need water, today's a little bit cooler than the last two weeks. Um, please uh, make it avail It is available. Uh, you should have got one when you came in. Washrooms are through that door uh, if you need one. Masks inside, all that good stuff. And uh, I just have a few announcements before we jump into today's message. Um, families, kids, school age. So JK uh, up to grade uh, five, I believe. Um, we have uh, vacation Bible camps. Uh, we're doing the backyard style this year. That way we can keep the group smaller. And we have a few all over the city, uh, different weeks. The first week starts not this week, but next week. And so if you'd like more information about that or sign up uh, for that, or maybe you have, uh, uh, you're a grandma and grandpa and you have grandkids that are looking for something to do this summer or parents, um, you're looking to uh, have some time without your kids after homeschooling all, schooling all year, um, this is for you and uh, for your neighbor's friends, uh, their kids as well. So that is starting soon and for the rest of us we can be praying for emily and our new summer student gabriel uh they're going to be uh driving around the city this summer uh loving on kids sharing jesus and and having a great time so i just have a very special announcement before uh, today and forgive me i i don't normally read my notes but i i, I thought it was important enough that i i'm gonna read most of it probably so Anyway, I, many of you know about the, the crazy heat wave that's going on. And apparently, uh, passed away uh, from the fires there, but they had 49.6 degree record, which is like, I don't know, the middle of Arizona or Nevada, like, you know, the places where you can fry eggs on the cement in um, BC. And we're not used to that kind of temperature. I got an angry email this week uh, from a friend said, Canada is burning. And he wasn't talking about the forest fires or the temperature and climate change. He was talking about things burning in Canada uh, socially, politically. And uh, with all of the residential school stuff coming back up, the failures and the sins of our past uh, are coming to light again and, and bringing a lot of attention and upheaval. Statues are toppling, and churches, uh, not just Catholic or white, are being vandalized. And ironically, a lot of these churches are the very community hubs and places where people of uh, all different colors and cultures and races uh, go to worship, to grieve, to love, to serve. Don't worry, this is not a speech about Canada Day, okay? or what park the parkway should be called, or what school should be called, or anything like that. I'm raising these issues for a greater issue, a greater reconciliation that each of us in Canada, regardless of race, color, culture, or creed, and that's reconciliation with our creator. Now, for some of us, this might seem new, uh, the horrible ways that we have treated each other as human beings, sought to dominate or control each other. It is as old as humanity and civilization. The Bible says even the most civilized. And that's because we are broken people living in a broken world. And yet, in this greater it is required, there is a greater opportunity and a greater, better reconciliation that is not just the source of our hope, but also the source of our healing. And as Christians, he is the savior that we are to share and shine forth. It's not the first or more likely the last time that our civilized world and ways will be shaken and exposed. Yet in each time before us, God's people, God's true people, not institutions or buildings, but people who truly have been captured by the awesome holiness of God and humbled by the grace he alone can give, have shared and served healing they have received with the culture that is around them. And so this is what we're to do as Christians. We're supposed to pass on in word and deed the grace and mercy that has been extended to us. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians, we are to be agents of reconciliation. As the true brokenness of our world is up close, is getting harder and harder to ignore. And the trite answers and virtue signaling, apologies without action, 
If we're honest, none of us, no program, no act, can truly make restoration for all that has been lost. But the Bible says that God has reconciled us to himself in Jesus. Jesus came close. He took on our hurt, our pain, our sin. He paid for it on the cross. And none of us can stand upright and righteous before a holy God. We are all without excuse, people of unclean lips, surrounded by people with unclean lips. We are all undone except Jesus. He has come to bind up the brokenhearted, to set the captives free. And we, who are followers of his, have been sent to declare and to demonstrate, to explain and to exhibit this great love that has been given, not only to us, but to all people. Jesus was not political, and so don't worry, West Village. Jesus was not political, but he was for people. His church, I believe, is to be the same. As Paul chair thermostats. Paul was contained and content, and therefore he was contagious. We're still reading his letters today by the grace of God. Let me pray, and then we're going to look at the last few verses in the book of Philippians. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. And Lord God, as Isaiah proclaimed, I'm an unclean man. We are an unclean people. No one can stand before you. We're reminded again, even in this beautiful country, on this beautiful day, that we are broken. That each of us have gone our own way and in our pride, we think that we can somehow solve the human condition of our sin. And Lord Jesus, thank you that you did what we cannot do. You lived the perfect life that none of us can live. And you died the atoning sacrifice that each of us owed. You died in our place and you rose again, showing that the price was paid and paid in full. And so, Lord, today, may we live into the reality that you are a risen Savior, that the truth about who you are and what you've done and what you're doing and what you promised to do in not just reconciling us to God, but also restoring all things to bring ultimate justice. Help us, Lord, to live for you. To be your agents and ambassadors. To bring the message of the good news of who you are and what you've done to our world that desperately needs to hear about you. And help us to show, help us to show that the healing, the hope that is found in you. Today, Lord, as we finish up uh, this part of your word, I pray that you would help us to not just learn in our heads, but to learn in experience as we go out from this place and follow you, that we would learn, learn, truly learn, and live contented in every circumstance because of who you are and what you've done. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, here we go. Philippians chapter 4. Like I said, Paul is writing from prison, and he, it's not because he's done anything uh, morally wrong. He's been sharing the good news about Jesus. And uh, it's landed him in prison because he was making people upset about saying these things. And now he's writing to a church in a Roman Empire city called Philippi. And this group of people uh, are being a pushed and shoved in every direction, just like Christians throughout history, to be this way, think this thing, do that thing, don't do this thing. And he's writing to encourage them about not being this way, but to be rooted, deeply established in Jesus and the gospel and to share and live that way, to not chase happy, but to catch joy in Jesus. And so he writes in verse 10, he goes, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly 
that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation that I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance, and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So in this letter, the secret, he spells it out. He says, I have learned the secret to being content. I have learned, whether it's good, bad, whatever, I've learned how to not be a thermometer, but to be a thermostat. And you notice in verse 12, he just flat out says it. It is that he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. That is the secret. I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, catching joy in Jesus means we can learn the secret of being content in all circumstances. There's two ways that come out of, this, out of this passage that I want to highlight for us today. Two ways that we can learn this secret. That we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Learn the secret to being content in all circumstances. Here's the first way. Through him, we could face any situation because he strengthens us. The secret to being content in every circumstance is that through him, we could face any situation because he strengthens us. Now, remember I said, it says, I could do all things. The way that he is, is speaking here makes it sound so much uh, like he's uh, learned the secret, and it's this idea of, of, of self-sufficiency. The word that he uses there is one that was very popular with the Stoics. Okay, Socrates used this word about being self-sufficient. And yet Paul flips it on his head, and he says, I'm not self-sufficient, I am Christ-sufficient. See, the idea of being self-sufficient in, in the Stoic days is just like today, that within myself, I have everything I need to live the life that I want to live, my best life now. And Paul is saying, I don't have everything in me to live the, the life that I need to live. I have everything in Christ to live the life that I live. The Amplified version of the Bible, you, you know, it's called Amplified because it amps everything up big time, okay? It's not a word-for-word -word translation at all, but sometimes it's really, really fun to look at how they amplify or turn the volume up on a verse. So this is what they did uh, with 4, it's, uh, 412. It said this, I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. It's similar to what Jesus said in John 15, right? When he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Okay? This is, this is what Paul is saying here. I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. How does he strengthen us? Well, Peter wrote this in 2 Peter 1. He said this, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partake of divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue 
and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection. For if these qualities are yours and increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's similar to what Peter, uh, what Paul says earlier in chapter 2, where he says, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, with respect and with seriousness. Work out. Why? Because it is God who wills and works in you for his good pleasure. See, all these attributes that Paul talks about, that Peter talks about, we can't do these things on our own. These are the fruit of the Spirit. This is and having his Spirit indwell in us. He is working in us godliness, patience, love, joy, peace, and we work it out. So how does he strengthen us? He strengthened us by his Spirit in pouring into us this new character that we then are to work out in our lives. Our affections change. And we have a part to play in that. You notice that Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Remember earlier he said when he was in prison, he was in Christ in prison. And it's a good way for us to think about everything that we go through in our lives, good and bad, that, that in this situation, in this challenge, I am still in Jesus. But that also means as we go through situations, that we can go through situations through him. The best example I had of this is, oh, well, I got two, okay? So, so if you like firefighting, this one will appeal to you. If you like sports, the other one will appeal to you. Here's the first one, okay? Imagine a firefighter goes into a building. It's on fire. You're in there. He's got all the protective equipment on. He's got the gas mask on. He is there to save you. And he says, get behind me, follow me. And then he makes his way through the flames. And your job, my job, is to stay as close as possible to him as he makes the way through and I could go through all things in Jesus. Second illustration football. Have you ever noticed that quarterbacks, well, they're getting bigger, but usually they're not that big. How do they ever, ever stay alive on a football field? It's other men who have been gifted to be big. I used to take the Ottawa uh, GG's football players, some of them went to our young adult. The place I could take them was the all-you-can-eat buffet at Tucker's Marketplace downtown. And for every meal or every time we went up, and I can eat. Those of you who know me, I can, I can eat. I can eat well. I have a hollow leg. But these guys would go through with two plates for every one plate that I had. So I, I, I had like two trees beside me, and we'd go through the buffet, and they were doing double. It was unbelievable. That's why Tucker's Marketplace is closed now. But I'm telling you right now that if we were on the football field, my job would be behind those guys as possible. And I would say that the same thing is true as we go through challenges in life, hard things, all things. Let's do it through Jesus. Sticking close to him. Last week, one of the darlings that got cut off because of time in my message was about, uh, last week we talked whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is good, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is excellent, anything that is praiseworthy, think about or focus, meditate on these things. And, and what, what I didn't say, because I, I figured we all kind of got it, is that Paul isn't saying whatever the world defines as true or excellent or praiseworthy or lovely or good. He has a very specific definition in mind. It's what God says is true and excellent and praiseworthy and right. And how do we know what that is? Well, those words are attributes that he wants us to focus on. For word, what is found in Psalm 19. And Psalm 19, Cole's notes version of Psalm 119. Isn't it nice how they line that up for us? Which is all about God's word. And it's not that we can only find what is true and excellent and right and praiseworthy in God's word, but God's word is the very 
measurement by which we can judge everything else to be true or right or lovely or good. Do you remember last week, Paul says, uh, right before that, he goes, do not be anxious, but come to God with your requests, with your supplications. Now, Rick Warren makes a great analogy for meditation. And this is the other one. It's not just by his spirit, but it's also by his word. And his spirit reminds us of his word and illuminates his word for us, that it is true, that it is right. And then he empowers us to live it. But Rick Warren says this. He goes, if you know how to to meditate, you think about it, right? Worrying is just taking something that's really, really negative and playing it over and over and over and over in your head, right? Let's look at it from this angle. Yeah, that's still really horrible. I feel horrible. Let's look at it from the... Yeah, that's it too. Meditating on God's word is sinful and good and right and true, and we're playing it over and over and over And as we do that, God changes us. He fills us up with good food. And then we are ready to see and to go and to be all that he is working in us out. So he strengthens us. We can learn to be content in all circumstances because through him we can face any situation, any situation because he strengthens us. Now, notice here that he goes on to say, it's not just in the really hard things, it's also in abundance. Do you notice that? He says, how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance, and need. I think many of us, as Warren Wearsby says, we've learned how to be abased, but many of us haven't learned how to abound in Christ or through Christ. We, by nature, know to kind of get behind Jesus when there's a fire or there's giant things coming at us. But do we know how to get behind Jesus when things are really good? I would argue in the West that that's harder for us. It's like me getting behind those linebackers and going through and then all of a sudden going, I just did it victory dance next play guys don't worry i got this that's how we live isn't it because money has this uh, ability abundance has a success all of these things have this way of of making it so that we don't do all things through Christ. And Paul here is saying, I, I've learned the secret to be content, not just when things are really hard, but I've learned how to be content when things are really, really good. I don't have to get the next best thing, the next best thing, the next best thing. Which remember Simon Cowell a few weeks ago, he goes, I'm never happy because I'm always waiting for the next thing. I'm always going after the next thing. He has not learned to be content in every circumstance. That's why really wealthy, really successful people are just as messed up and just as disappointed as people who have nothing. It has to do with their heart, not with what they got. So how do we deal with this? Verse 17 to 19, there's three things that kind of come out here. You notice he says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases your credit. See, Paul's priority here is not about getting the, his joy is not found in the fact that the Philippian church has supported him, okay? It's not found in that. You notice that he says that that you guys weren't doing it. Now I rejoice in the fact that you have. And the word that's used here is is this idea of, it's the only time it's used in the New Testament. Um, But in the Old Testament, it was used often to talk about blossoming. It's like, you've remembered me again. And he's happy about that. But he wants to make it very clear that it's not that he needed it from them in order to rejoice in the Lord. 
And so the first way that we could kind of get off this track and start to be able to be content in abundance is to not chase after the gifts, but chase after the gift giver. You notice that he's excited, not because of what they've given, but why they've given. You notice that? It's, he says the fruit that's being born up in you. He says, this is what excites me. This is what gets me going. Jesus has captured your hearts. Your priorities are changing. You're becoming generous about the right things. Rick Warren, again, he says this, God's remedy against the love of money is generosity. And I would add that it's joy in Christ is the motivation to be generous. And Rick Warren would know he's written the best-selling book of all time other than the Bible. After he wrote, him and his wife, Kay, were tithing. Their goal was to tithe more every year. This is before he wrote the Purpose Driven Life, to tithe 1% more every year from when they started the church. And God looks down and goes, there's a guy I can trust with writing the book that's almost as good as my book. I'm joking. Generosity is the cure. But you notice that he goes on in verse 18. You notice he goes on and he says, I've received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. And what are these gifts? They're a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. See, the second thing is that, that all these gifts, really, the giving of them wasn't giving them to Paul. It was giving them to God. It's all his anyway. The second thing is not just generosity, but flipping our heart around to, to understand that, 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 that when we serve God in this way, when we are content in abundance, it's because we are a giving towards the things that are of God. Because we're content in him. These things are all his anyway. And then finally, verse 19 you notice that he says, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. See, he's the one who gives so we can give. And around here at West Village, we call it blessed to bless. God entrusts these things to us. And this is important because as Proverbs 30 says, give me only my daily bread, otherwise I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Romans 11, 35 and 36 says, who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. And that's where Paul goes next, right? In verse 20 goes into this doxology. He ends his, his letter to them by giving all the praise, all the glory to God. So how do we posture ourselves to learn this contentment? Learn here is this idea of experience, and it's unfortunate, but in, in the second uh, part of that where it says learned again, it's actually a different word. There, it, when it says learn the secret, it's a word that has to do with like being brought in or initiated in, in the cultic uh, practices of the day. So the first learned, I've learned to be content, is this learned through experience. As I've lived my life, Paul is saying, I have learned what it means to be content in all circumstances. But then he says, and I've learned this secret... And here he's saying, I've been initiated into this secret, into this way of knowing things and living things. And I think sometimes we don't want that. We want to be able to learn that by sitting here, by listening to a podcast. And Paul is saying, no, no, it doesn't work that way. It's learned through going through life and getting behind Jesus. It's learned through being generous and giving it's learned. And the second part, initiated. I don't like that. Because what that means is, is Paul isn't sitting back going, I'm going to decide the circumstances in my life by which I am going to learn how to be 
content in all circumstances. And I'm going to learn what it means to ha do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm going to pick those things. No, he says, I've been initiated into those things. Now, I know in our world today, students are totally protected from initiations. But when I went into grade nine, it was the scariest time of my life. Grade nine initiation was horrible. I remember running with my friends through the hallways. And those of you who aren't part of the woke generation, you know what I'm talking about. Your friend's older brothers were looking for you and you spent lunch hour hiding, hiding in lockers, hiding in stairwells. Why? Because they were going to wedge you like you've never been wedged before. So we would cut our underwear so it would rip easy. Sorry if that's graphic. But this is the reality that we lived in. I did not get to pick my initiation. It was picked for me. Thing. Not to punish us, but God wants us to learn. Learn that we have everything in Christ. And how does he do it? He initiates us into things that we don't like that don't make us happy, but where we can actually find true joy. So how do we position ourselves? Kind of tip my hand already. I put it like this, in him and sacrifice because he supplies us. In him, we can fellowship and sacrifice because he supplies us. Verse 14 and verse 15 both use a word that is a, uh, has a prefix on it, but it's a word you've heard before, koinonia, which is the one we translate into fellowship. And it's not fellowship, i.e. Sunday school picnics and things like that. It's fellowship as in held in common these core values and way of life beliefs that are lived into action. We hold these things together. We have a fellowship, like fellowship of the ring. It wasn't that they all just thought the ring was cool. It was that they were band together. I'm sorry, I did a little rings reference. I said I'd never do that again. They banded together on a mission to get the ring gone, I think. I think that's how it goes. You can correct me later. Yeah? We're all saying yeah. Okay. So, you notice here that Paul is thanking them. He says, you've shared in my trouble. Paul, wasn't, it wasn't that he wasn't happy that he got a gift from them. He was totally happy. But that's not where his joy or his purpose was found. But he delights in the fact that they share. And the word there is share is that fellowship word. Share in the troubles. And it's not just troubles in general. It's troubles in seeing the gospel go forward really interesting again is where is Paul right now he's in prison that wasn't his plan he was initiated into that but you notice in verse 22 who's coming to Christ because Paul is in prison do you see it in the text this is amazing do you see it all the saints greet you especially those of Caesar's household. Paul didn't want to be in prison. And yet in prison, as the Philippians are supporting him, as they are sharing together in this fellowship of the gospel to see it go forward, they are sacrificing in different ways, but they are all sacrificing for this one purpose. And even people in Caesar's household are coming to know Jesus. Oh, church, if we would get this, that the stuff that, that God initiates us into, even if we don't like it, the, the opportunities we have to learn these things are actually there. And as we come together for the gospel, that, that God uses these things and he's learning, we are learning, but also others are coming to learn and know and follow Jesus too. And this is why he's learned the secret. This is why he's okay. This is why he's, he's all right and why he wants to flip. God is supplying for them every need. Now, this is not health and wealth, prosperity gospel here. You know, it, God, God helping you do all things and supplying all your needs according to God's riches and glory is not talking about you being able to make it to the NFL or win a Grammy, Okay. It's not about if you pray hard enough, you'll get a Ferrari or a jet, okay? It's none of those things. 
supplying every need here according to Christ's riches and glory is about giving us what we need to be able to live the life that God has called us to live. He will give us everything we need. So here's Paul sitting in prison and he could say, God is giving me everything I need to live for him in prison. And he's saying to the church at Philippi, God is giving you everything you need. Because you notice it's according to the riches in glory in Christ Jesus. It's about him. It's together for the gospel. It's together for his glory. Warren Wearsby says, life is not a series of accidents. It's a series of appointments. He goes on to say, God has not promised to supply all our greeds. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. This does not mean that God does not supply all our needs. Remember the Sermon on the Mount? Jesus says, look at, look at the sparrows. Look at how God takes care of things. Do not worry about all these things, whether you're going to be clothed or whether you're going to be fed. God loves you more than these. Aren't you more important than these birds? Yes, but seek first the kingdom of God. And then what? All these things will be added unto you. God does supply our needs above and beyond. Look at us. But have we learned to abound in him? Now, I realize this is easier said than done, and I'll finish with this. You notice how Paul ends his letter? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. See, if you're unsettled here today because you're like, oh, my goodness, this is a lot of stuff. I can't do this. I can't work myself up into this. No, you can't. You shouldn't. At the end of the day, this is all him. And so with humility, with repentance, we come before him and say, Jesus, I don't know how to abound in you. I don't know how to go through hard times in you. I need you. We need Jesus not just to save us in eternal life. We need Jesus to help us live that life, his life through us, and it's his grace. I love this. Peter ends or begins his first letter to Christians who had lost homes, separated from their families, had their property taken, and Nero starting to burn them. And he writes this. Though you have not seen him, talking about Jesus. Remember, Peter did. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the of your souls. One commentator said this, why were they able to still have glorious joy even though all, all these things were taken? It says, because the source of their joy was Jesus. And since no one could take their Jesus, no one could take their joy. So what about you? What has been taken from you? Your health, your house. Have you buried a dream? Have you buried a marriage? Have you buried a friend? As you look at these burial plots of life, is your joy buried there too? Max Licata wrote this in a little devotional called Contagious Joy. He said this, since no one can take your Christ, no one can take your joy. Think about it. Can death take your joy? No, because Jesus is greater than death. Can failure take your joy? No, because Jesus is greater than your sin. Can betrayal take your joy? No, because Jesus will never leave you. Can sickness take your joy? No, because God has promised, whether this side of the grave or the other, to heal you. Can disappointment take your joy? No, because through your plan, though your plan may not work out, you know God's plan will. Death, failure, betrayal, sickness, disappointment, they cannot take your joy because they cannot take your Jesus. And as Jesus promised in John 16, 22, no one will take away your joy. Let me pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for Jesus.
Lord Jesus, you are the greatest gift. You are the greatest joy. Forgive us for chasing after all of these happenings, for being thermometers and not thermostats. Help us to set our lives, our hearts, our minds, our passions. Help us to set them on you. And as we do, Lord, I pray that we would find deeper and deeper contentment in you and you alone. And out of that, that we would become contagious, that as we set our lives on you, that that will change the temperature around us, that many more would come to know you, to find their healing and their hope beyond happiness, their joy in you. For your glory and yours alone, we pray. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing together one song, and then we're going to celebrate communion. Again, it's all about him. So we refocus together today.